Hello, all you positive heads out there. It's so good to be back with all you beautiful reflections of the one source consciousness that creates and animates all things. If you're new to this podcast, of course, we are super happy to have you here. And we just ask that you bring an open mind and heart to your listening experience and to be prepared to explore vantage points that I'm convinced will help shift or solidify your current understanding of the ultimate nature of reality in a way that is extremely empowering. Speaking of exploring powerful perspectives, I'm super excited to announce the release of my very first book, The Golden Key, Modern Alchemy to Unlock Infinite Abundance. If you're ready to alchemize the circumstances in your life so that your abundance expands to an entirely new level in 2021, Head over to goldenkey.gift to download the audio or ebook as my gift to you by using the code POSITIVEHEAD. All right, all you positive heads, on this week's Soul Share episode, I'm very excited to have the epic musical artist East Forest here with me on the show. East Forest music was described by the Huffington Post as full of rich bass, introspective soundscapes, a biophony of nature that doesn't just create sound, it creates narrative. I agree with this analysis. Uh, East is also the host of the Tin Laws podcast where he mixes it up with creatives, thought leaders, and dreamers. Hello, East. Welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks, brother. Super nice to be introduced into your world. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's, it's Awesome when worlds collide, especially, you know, I've, I've, uh, I forget who someone, you know, along the lines, maybe six months or so ago, year ago, um, introduced me to your music and it has, uh, definitely become, uh, a staple in my world. So, you know, uh, as soon as I saw you had a podcast, I'm like, ah, I want to bring him on. And so I'm really glad this happened because then I think someone from your world reached out first. I'm like, perfect. And oh, cool. it's just one of those things that's, that's meant to align. So I'm excited to explore and, and just hear all the, all the magical things you're up to. I, I would like to start with the, my, my cliche opening question whenever I have a guest on that I like to ask. You're in an elevator. The woman next to you looks over, says, what's your passion? You got 10 floors to answer. What do you say? <laughs> um, I would say my passion is reminding other souls of that. The fact that we're doing this walk as souls. Yeah. Um, I like feeling like a cheerleader that kind of whispers in our ears and in essence, whispering in my own ear, we can do this. Yeah. I like, like yes, that. Keep going, keep uh-huh. going. And yeah, I need to hear that too. So as we know, I mean, I'm whispering in one ear, it's just right into my own. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I, I always say we teach best what we most need to learn. And so, you know, that's exactly when I started this podcast, you know, years ago, that was sort of, if you listen to episode one, it's like, well, I know at least one person's going to benefit from this me. So, (laughs) you know, anything else is icing on the cake. So I fully, fully resonate with that. Well, if you would, I always like to at least get a little bit of backstory so that there's some context for the listeners, you know, who are just being exposed to to you and your world. Um, You know, whatever feels relevant, it doesn't have to be like, you know, what you ate in fifth grade on your birthday or anything like that, but just whatever feels most relevant to, to share, to give us some context. Well, I grew up in Oregon and my upbringing, although like I was in Boy Scouts, my parents and I, we all went camping and I think that made a pretty indelible influence on me. I had a fairly suburban, super American upbringing that was very safe on paper and I'm very loving, beautiful parents, but I think I was inside a uh it took me a long time to kind of realize this <laughs> you know it's like there was a sickness to the the like malaise of the lack of risk and the not you know like especially back then portland wasn't a cool place hmm. uh, and it not a lot came through you know mm-hmm. so the information you received is like the nightly news the mainstream story was the story and life was pretty stable but also in a way maybe too stable. And I felt very depressed. I, I, I mean, I had panic attacks as early as like kindergarten and first grade. And, wow. 
it just it just didn't it just didn't add up i couldn't make sense of like the map in front of me and what people were kind of ex the expectations i started to realize so um so in a lot of ways i had a lot of support and was able to do some amazing things just like in the arts and and be outdoors but it was also like kind of the standard american upbringing that was just felt like putting a circle into a square like i just could never just could never make sense for me and i struggled with that and eventually i feel like it really broke me where i thought like there is no way to fight this paradigm you just have to join it and so i joined it by trying to exceed at school and i was like then i have to become a doctor or that was my plan you know because then it, maybe i won't yeah you know, I, I i loved my parents and i love them deeply but i also didn't want to become my parents and this is a prototypical story yeah most relate people. yeah <laughs> So I, I, I think that was my biggest worry is that because I, I just knew in my heart something bigger or more beautiful was, was possible. Uh, and I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to get there. And so it really wasn't until when I was in my late 20s in New York City where I eventually ended up. And that was part of my path. I was like, maybe I'll go to the biggest city and you know that'll be the way to do it. <laughs> And it was, you know, some psychedelic experiences that really started to break me open and show me through felt experiences, really behind that veil of the mystery of like, but there's more, there has to be more. And it, I didn't have a background through religion or really anything else to, to, to find it. And so when I felt it, when I actually felt it uh, through some seminal experiences, that showed me that it was real in a sense. And it, it allowed me to touch parts of my own psyche and heart that uh, now became not like an idea. It was like, oh my gosh, that's there it is. So that really lit a fire in me. And part of that fire was exploring uh, music as a method of, of getting there more reliably or faster or just again at all. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So you are currently not in New York, right? You, you, right, right. So I, at, at that time when I was in there for 10 years about, and when I started to quote unquote, wake up and just go through my own transformation and inner transformation, I eventually moved to Portland, Oregon, because now it was the cool place to be right. and it was my sort of my home. And I went there with my, my partner at the time and did that for seven years. And that was sort of a beautiful transitionary experience and really just started diving into the East Forest Project head first. And then um, eventually went through another transition in life and ended up in Southern Utah and Boise, Idaho. Southern Utah, because I had I stumbled upon that place through Reality Sandwich. I don't know if you remember Evolver oh, yeah. and Reality yeah. Sandwich mm -hmm. back in the day. Yeah, They did a conference down there in 2008 with Daniel Pinchbeck, Charles Eisenstein, and Dennis McKenna. Mm -hmm, and this was mm -hmm. back when psychedelics were like not not cool or certainly mm -hmm. like weird. You know, there are probably 30 people there. You know, now right, it's right. like 3,000. You know? Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. And, and so I went to this conference and fell in love with the landscape and the owners of the ranch there. Uh, you know, actually one of the owners, Ron, it's his birthday today, 60. So shout out to Ron and, and giving him some props for – helping me like make a home there. Mm -hmm. And it's only 200 people. It's super, super duper nature, canyons, mountains, wildlife. Cool. Uh, and then Boise, Idaho, I, I, I met a girl, my partner Rada, and she lives here with her kids. So I split my time. Nice. Very, very cool. Well, you know, one of the things, like I said uh, early on, as I was uh, exposed to your music uh, initially, and now of course your podcast, um, you know, maybe a year or so ago, and it, it seems like, you know, and then it's come up a bunch of times. I was just talking with um, Ragu Marcus the other day who runs the Love Serve Remember Foundation. And he brought up checking out some of the music that you did with Ram yes. Das. And uh, so, uh, you know, what a, what a cool thing. And it really seems like you, you're in a very expansive phase with, with all of it from, from what I can see and feel. Um, so what, what do you think is... Yeah, I mean, what, what what do you think is sort of the the key to that, and has been the key to that for you? You know, how have you um, kind of got yourself into the position of exponential growth that you're in? <laughs> when I was in first grade, uh, I was alluding to an experience where it's the first day of school, 
And I remember what I remember it. I remember walking in and I crossed into the threshold of the, the, the schoolroom and I saw the desks kind mm-hmm. of in that systematic order. And I said to the room and the teacher, I said, I said, this isn't for me. Thank you very much. And I left. And hmm, there was something in that where I think instead of trusting like that inner part of me, I was sort of forced because there wasn't an alternative to, I didn't learn how to then trust what is unfolding in a way. Like I didn't, it took me a long, long time, several decades, and then come back around to be like, oh, how do I not control everything? In essence, like that was sort of the medicine I had to create for myself to make it in this world. It was like, okay, for me, it was about control Mm -hmm. and and working things because no one's looking out for you and you have to watch your own back and now you need to succeed and that's the only way. Mm -hmm. And over time, it became more about what if something is watching over me or what if I am part of a harmonic system that it's more about just being in harmony with it, which is about a f- kind of loosening the grip or letting go. And that really took shape, I think, um, in, in many stages, but the, the Ram Dass album was a big one because at first I had this idea and, I, and in my mind, I had convinced Raghu to let me do it. Mm-hmm. Thank God he said yes. Hmm. But it wasn't until I was sitting down with Ram Dass for the first moment and the door shut and I hit record and I was like, oh my God, like, yeah, how did this happen? <laughs> you know, and it, and it kind of hit me that the way he looked at me and and the energy he gave me and the, the role of his teacher, Neem Karoli Baba Maharaji, who played a role in this happening for me, which is sort of his own story. And there's a picture of Maharaji just over Ram Dass's shoulder on the um the bookshelf and right as that moment happened where I was just like this holy shit moment mm-hmm. uh, I saw that picture of Maharaji and he was laughing in the picture mm-hmm. it's like the big belly laugh and mm-hmm. it's sort of like he's laughing at me like when are mm-hmm. you gonna get it you know like, yeah 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 you're always here in the thing and you you don't have to be worried that you're not part of it because you can't not be <laughs> right you're under the blanket and yeah <laughs> that really blew me open and the enormity of that experience realizes like, there's no way I'm in control of this. And it, there's a, like, there's a larger energy that I'm in a current of that we're all in a current of. And the more I let go into that feeling, the more alive it felt and has felt to this day, it feels like a very alive process um, with that record and watching its reverberation with people and then how that sort of leads into um, everything else. And it's really hard medicine for me to not feel like I have to manipulate and control each step. Like when any time, I don't know if you feel this, like opportunities come in your life and you're like, you want it to work. Yeah. So yeah. what's the first thing you do for me? It's like the natural response from my child is like, okay, it, it, what, what can I do to essentially manipulate this to make it work? Like yep. c- c- kind of control it. And where is that line between control and guide? Yep. Or allow. Did you feel that? At all Absolutely. Your- Absolutely. I feel that so much. It's like as someone who's constantly my whole life, I feel like I've been slow to even get that, that lesson to um, where it's just like, you know, I've always been sort of hyper productive and, you know, a doer, you know, and, and, and sort of even attach, um, you know, this idea, this idea of being someone who gets a lot done is like, this is a really good thing that I, Same. I'm so productive. Right. And it's like, uh, is it? <laughs> yeah, <right. You> know? <laughs> You're on a treadmill. It's like, where are we going? You know, yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> well, and trust, trust, right. Is, is the end of it, or you could call it faith or call it what you want, but it's sort of, for me, it's a mantra of I am held. Is something that feels yeah, really yeah. comforting mm-hmm. for me when I say that phrase to myself internally or aloud. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's this idea that we're not alone, and we, I think, inherently, our our world creates a system that we feel very separate as mm-hmm. individual, mm-hmm. isolated beings. And many of the activities we're doing online or with our digital attention currency mm-hmm. are increasing mm-hmm. that feeling of separation, which is truthfully unnatural it's very much on the surface of our beingness and so the more we can tap into the things that help us feel part of the larger whole that we are 
and psychedelics, you know, for me, it's like, that was like this huge one, but sure. you know, nature, practice, yoga, song, creativity, good conversation. There's all these things. I, is a, is a really good message. So I'm assuming that's been similar for you. Yeah, absolutely. I, I even had, I think it was yesterday or the day before this idea kind of hit me that the universe really, what it really wants you to do most of all is to be playful and actually will reward you for doing so. So instead of like, what is the most stringent, you know, check off, you know, my, my never ending checklist of to do's, what is the, the most playful way that I can go about today? And, and that's just something that literally just kind of hit me the other day. And that's beautiful. Like, yeah, it really that's, is. Right. That's so in line with like sort of a Joseph Campbell ask, you know, follow your bliss. That's just, mm -hmm. to me, there's similar energy there. Playfulness, blissfulness. Yep. Yeah. I like that being the lighthouse to follow because it's sort of the, the language of the soul. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's just like, and then I realize how, you know, when I'm, I'm so naturally playful, unless I'm just bogging myself down with all these to do's and missions and accomplishments that I feel I need to do to prove, like we said earlier, for what, where, where are we going again? <laughs> you know, and it's eating uh, to nowhere. Yeah. yeah right. <laughs> right. Right. And, and what a concept it is to, to really let it sink in that you, you couldn't not be a part if you tried. And the more you feel into that, the, more deeper the experience around that truth becomes, right? Yeah, maybe the game is uh, what things help you lean into that, you know, or what playful things help you cultivate that feeling. I mean, it's like focus on that because I hear you saying, and I found this to be true for myself too, you're like, what makes exponential growth? <laughs> and I would say it's it seems to be like you have to, it helps that you're in some kind of flow. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little chicken and the egg kind of thing, but it's like, I actually think the, the thing that comes first is cultivating that feeling of flow or playfulness or of being held. And from that, uh, you're creating some kind of energy that there's a resonance back, there's an echo. And that's the, the feedback in essence of life, of cause and effect. You have to create that cause or you can create that cause maybe um but no doubt look everything in the universe goes in ebbs and flows and waves so for, for me sure, it's sure. also about like learning how to ride the waves and recognize that my job is just to surf and you some eventually the wave ends and then you but then you go swim and wait for the next one you know so it's not trying to hold on to some awesome tube wave because it's like well this is the moment of this wave and yeah you don't have to worry about will there be another wave you know there's always waves of different shapes and sizes and some you catch great and some you don't and it's all good yeah yeah i i, I like to use the whole wave analogy as well or or the idea of when you're actually sitting on the beach and the you know income the swell comes in and it goes way up on the beach and then the retraction that happens right yeah. the water's getting sucked out <laughs> yeah. And, and knowing that like, okay, this retraction is a natural part of the ebb and flow of my experience and my existence. And so what's the good news about a retraction? Well, at some point, you know, coming ahead is going to be another, another swell and expansion. So, um, yeah, that I, I like to think of it in those terms as well and not being resistant to this natural process of a retraction that, that comes. Yeah. Um there's um, there's this analogy I use that's right in line with that about the grace of forgetting or the gift of forgetting and it just being the other uh, side of the yin and the yang of remembering. And we often mm. focus on remembering. Mm. And if you recognize that forgetting is the engine of remembering, it's necessary. It's, it's beautiful and important. So it's all these times we fall out and we're like, oh man, you know, I've, there I go again. It's like, no, 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 that's now you've remembered that's the dance. <laughs> it's, that's like, the dance. it's the dance of existence. And it's yeah. like, maybe it's the point. Yeah. We're yeah. always trying to push that away. Like yeah. I should be better than this, or I've been mm -hmm. practicing that and I've fallen again. It's like, what if falling is the point? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Two steps forward, one step back. 
It's this idea of like, you know, your reality being a spiral and you think it's oftentimes with lessons, right? Where we think we've, okay, I, I mastered that one. Oh shit. Here it is again. Same lesson, you know, for further, you know, clearing or clarification or shedding of, if you will. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. And maybe it's one step forward, one step back. It's like, does it matter? You know, it doesn't like... matter. Right. <laughs> the distance, you know, this, you play this idea of like, you know, the universe source, God, higher self, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's infinite in scope. So if it expands infinitely, no matter how far you go, you're still equidistant from no ending because there is no ending. So it's like, it really allows you to move into a space of like, okay, why am I in such a hurry again? Because no matter how far I get, there's going to be another vista that opens up before me of expansive eternity unfolding. And that being said, we get into the mystery itself with the paradoxes of uh, it's it's all perfect and, and the injustices that we uh, exist in around us, they matter. And it, it, it's meaningful to take action in the world. Like, and, and that coexists and part of us could say, well, how does that work? And it's like, that, that's the mystery itself. Uh, you know, we're not, I don't think we're meant to be in this dimensional reality just to recognize that nothing needs to be done. I think there's, there's probably also a clear reason that being able to do things in the world is part of the journey and having compassion and creating right action in the world to try to right that ship, even if it's one degree, you know, well, that can be a lot. In, in generations down the road yep. and you can't fix it all. And so, so it might feel meaningless, but I f it feels like that those acts of service are just as much the point as that everything is perfectly imperfect. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Fully, fully agree. So curious, how long have you been doing your podcast now? I guess it's about two and a half years. We're at 150 something and it's weekly. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I don't do as awesome. many as you, but well, that's just because you're, you, you, yeah, that's because you're sane. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, okay. So you've been at it for a minute. What, if you, who comes to mind is I always, I don't necessarily like this question, but I like asking it uh, I, when it's asked to me. Um, My but, least favorite guest. No. <laughs> yeah. 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 Who's your <laughs> least? Now we're talking. Who did you hate? Uh, what, what comes to mind is something that you have learned on the show or heard from someone that's come on as a guest that really like shifted a perspective for you? Well, I've learned how to listen better and not interrupt as much. And honestly, yeah. <laughs> I one definitely of the, do that. Yes. But I, there's a time to interject, but I've also learned the art of that, I guess. Uh, and doing it virtually, which has become, um, was well, a necessity over the last year. It actually makes, it forces you to interrupt even less just because of the nature of little bits of delay and stuff. Like it's it's very difficult to have an interjecting conversation as you might in person. Mm -hmm. So as I'm sure you've realized, you just kind of have to like give space and finding like rhythm with yourself and people of not rushing, but not being too slow and, and trusting like that, the pacing. And so if anything, it's probably slowing down over time. Mm -hmm. But I've had so many wonderful conversations, but one that comes to mind is with Bio Akomalafe, who is an author and a speaker and sort of just a, a poet. And I came across him through Charles Eisenstein, who is someone mm -hmm. that has been a teacher of mine for many years and a friend. And Bio, it's just, it's so inspirational. I mean, it was so inspirational. He was in India and we're doing this podcast just like this. And, and I recorded it, of course, and I ended up actually sampling him and using some of that in my album that's coming out right now in parts. And I'd never done that before. Like I'd use field recordings from nature locations and field recordings of people talking, all things I recorded, but I'd never, it's like, what if we pull from the podcast and put it into music? And right. he speaks in this song and I feel I don't want to say it encapsulates a lot of his teaching, but I, th I think it does for what I know of it, of that there's this invitation in front of us. And the invitation is one of becoming, meaning 
it's not about a destination we are going to arrive at or necessarily that we have arrived at one, but more that there's this process of composting. And through that, there's a transformation of becoming. And that is an invitation in front of us. And he uses this metaphor of like, we've dug up these bones. And what do we want to do with these bones? We can bury them again, or we can sit with them and see how they might want to speak to us. Uh, and that's kind of a way of speaking to the trauma that we're going through collectively and, and the transitions we're going through. And I just felt a brotherhood with him of his message and spirit that continues to reverberate. And so being able to put it into a song, the song's called Bones, comes <laughs> cool. out uh, probably in a, a month or two. Awesome. It's yeah. just like, yeah, he's a really special guy. And there's, there's been there's been many, many more. Yeah. That's one of the greatest gifts about doing what we do is getting to connect with people that, you know, especially when those you have those conversations that you just, that totally surprise you. And then something that sticks with you for years to come. I mean, part of what you just said made me think of uh, one of my own, a guy named Derek Rydall, who was on the show. Um, actually, I've had Charles on as well, Charles Eisenstein. And, um, but uh, Derek Rydall talked about this idea of like, he calls it the law of emergence. So, um, you know, but we hear a lot about law of attraction and sort of the, the, you know, you have a lot of like charged, you know, thoughts around law of attraction and, you know, how it works, et cetera, et cetera. But the law of emergence, the way he talks about it is I, I really, really resonate with is like, you know, how do you become what is the potential of your being. So it's like the, the oak tree is already within the acorn. It's, it's, you know, as I put in my, my book, uh, the golden key that I just, I just released a couple of months ago, you know, if the little boy finds the acorn and puts it on the shelf, there's very unlikely it's going to become an oak tree <laughs> right there in his room. Uh, if it's buried in the proper place with the proper sunlight, water, you know, all the right conditions, then, you know, what happens, this thing, you know, transforms in the most miraculous way to be the potential that was already inherent in it, just needing the right conditions to emerge. And also, of course, a part of that is, you know, there's some disruption to the acorn itself. It, it you know, cracks and breaks and, you know, much like the caterpillar to the butterfly, right? I mean, when the caterpillar thinks its world is over, it becomes a butterfly, same kind of idea. And so, you know, I love looking at it from this. It's like, it's all inherently in there, not so much as attracting something outside of yourself that you need to pull in, rather from the inside out becoming what is what is there in potential all along. Yeah, it's beautiful. It really plays to the idea of water in the garden. And like, that's the practice. Uh, mm. Sometimes there's weeds, sometimes there's aphids, sometimes it just needs a little more sun. Sometimes there's cold coming, you wanna cover the garden but you tend the garden. I, I look at relationships that way, you know, particularly yeah. romantic relationships. And I think about it as watering the garden. What are the activities you do that water the garden and help it uh, flourish and go through the seasons? Yeah. So that, yeah. that's a great way of, of I love that uh, acorn idea. Yeah, yeah. And it it's funny that you say that with relationships because I've used that same exact thing before. Like, I just want to be a good gardener, you know, in this relationship. And especially, you know, seeing someone fully bloom into what their potential is and how you can, you can play a role in that is particularly gratifying and rewarding. I think. Yeah. You throw kids into the mix and it's a whole nother level. <laughs> of I don't know if it's like a giant There's a lot of shit in there. there. Yeah. <laughs> Good fertilizer. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, it's great. Before we continue on with today's episode, I'd like to take a quick moment to tell you about our sponsor Noom. Noom is a unique, habit-changing solution that helps users learn to develop a new relationship with food. And it's not a diet. No food is considered good or bad. As we talk about on this show all the time, it's all about proper balance and having good habits. And Noom just teaches you how to look within your own mind and make better decisions for yourself. Sounds familiar, right? It's based in psychology, eating better to feel better. It focuses on the story that we tell around food and how to feel good about our choices. And they make it all super easy to do with a minimal commitment of only 10 minutes a day, which is essential for someone like me with so much on my plate. 
pun intended. So if you guys would like to try out the cognitive behavioral approach to losing weight that has led to 80% of Noomers finishing the program and 60% sticking to their goals for at least one year, head over to Noom.com forward slash positive head to start your trial today. That's spelled N-O-O-M dot com forward slash positive head. I mean, what do you have to lose except outdated habits and perhaps a few extra pounds by signing up for the trial? Once again, that's N-O-O-M dot com forward slash positive head. Check it out. So I know you've done some st- you've done some things uh, with Google and John Hopkins and some consciousness hacking related work. Uh, care to share a little bit about that? Well, I'm always interested in technology because it's something that we're not escaping from. I don't think we really have the option to go into a cave or whatnot, and that's our method of spiritual erudition anymore. Not that that's even that practical for people. So I'm I'm very interested in how we can be part of the world and also feel we have a more meaningful and grounded walk with it. So technology is not something I say inherently, look, you need to not use it or avoid it. Quite the opposite. It's like, are there ways that we can use it as a tool? I see music as a tool, as a form of technology too. So yeah, I've always been exploring different collaborations and did some interesting things with like that neuroesthetics project with John Hopkins and Google and um and there's lots of things going on right now in the field of psychedelics with uh, Imperial College, um, just like an advisory role to them or, or creating, you know, there's things with like music and biofeedback and dynamic generation of music or brainwaves connected to music and how that affects the music, um, um, all sorts of things that, that create connection with yourself and your connection with others. So I, I think there's going to be a lot more of this in the future as things, even like the streaming services move into 360 sound and potentially forms of VR and AI. And it's a, it's, it's crazy kind of things that we could be doing in the near future, as far as really personalizing your experience just with music alone. Yeah. I think, you know, talking about music and sound, it's like asking a fish what water is. I mean, I think it's so powerful and present in our lives. We don't even we don't totally don't give it credence for what it is and what it can do. Yeah. I saw, um, I saw an interesting quote the other day. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Grant, but, um, Uh, no, very interesting guy and, um, crazy, very wild story too. He was like sort of CEO of like big, like Bosch and Loam or something. And then had a, had a pretty, uh, you know, powerful spiritual experience that then led to him downloading all these like, you know, mathematical formulas and things like that. And he took such a shift really? in his journey. Yeah. He, he, very, very interesting guy. Uh, happy to connect him with you. If, I think you'd really like. Sounds cool. Yeah. With. Yeah. He's super cool. And I saw him post something the other day. He said, um, um, geometry is frozen sound. <laughs> and I thought that was a really oh, cool. Oh, that's so accurate. Oh, oh yeah. <sighs> <laughs> no. Yeah, cymatics. I think we'll show you yep, that. Yep, yep, uh, yep. Frozen light is frozen matter. Damn, yeah, so, that's a, yeah, that's, a, <laughs> that's I love that. I love that. I had What's a feeling you would appreciate it. Robert Grant. Robert Grant. Yeah, that's a check. very common name. <laughs> yeah, check him out. I think you will really resonate. And like I said, happy to make a connection. I just feel like, yeah, be 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 good. Um, but. Um, yeah, man. Wow. So w- when you were, you know, working on some of those, those programs, like what, what it, all did it entail? What, you know, how, how was your contribution and what did you, you know, well, the, the neuroesthetics like? project, that's, a, that's kind of a burgeoning field of research and science that asks how design affects our neurophysiology. Neurophysi- so, um, Google, teamed up with John Hopkins to build three different rooms. And they took this, this exhibit to the salon in Italy design exposition. And each room had a very different design. And that included the scent in the room and the sounds I was doing the music Mm. and 
and everything, textures. And so you would put on this piece of wearable uh, tech, kind of like an Apple Watch, but it was a Google device they developed, a little band. Mm-hmm. And you, could, you would just be in the, each room with a small group for ten, five minutes in each room. The, you weren't talking, but you could do anything else you wanted. You could look at the books they had in there or sit down or smell things, whatever. Just be in it. And you'd move through each consecutive room. And then afterwards, they would put that armband into, they'd read the data and your physiology and, and try to give you some information about what forms of design respond to your body in different ways. Mm-hmm. Wow. But that's what they're they're looking at, design and physiology. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> you know, that was just sort of like a high level project that I was doing a, a piece of. Um, but I'm I'm very interested now, and in, I did some stuff with consciousness hacking. It's Mikey Siegel's project of group flow, and you know, it's wiring people up to measure things like emotional response or heart rate, or breathing, and so forth to see how you can engender group connection. Mm -hmm, So he mm -hmm. would do things like illuminate your heartbeat on a little light that you could pick up and stuff. And then we could also connect that to a speaker, like a subwoofer. So now it's like a big sound, but then I could change the sounds into other things like frogs and things. And then you could like hand your heart to someone else and then you'd be holding their heart and hearing and feeling it. And then you could obviously combine the data into another light that see and it would see is the whole group getting into any coherence and so it's very experimental on like what is group connection and super techy and really fun and i was doing the uh like music stuff with that live and we did we actually did that at esalen and that was fun and we we did a couple a couple iterations of that and i think mikey's idea from what he's told me is that he'd love it just to get so it's not clunky it's just super streamless and very simple and it's this idea of how can technology that's part of our lives help to create these states of connection with with others. So uh, this can go on and on. And there's stuff right now uh, with Wave Pass. I've been I've written some music for them, and they're making music for ketamine guidance that's generative and dynamic. And it's all again responding to what's going on in your body and your emotional state. And this will probably go into places with AI, perhaps even, you know, you wake up in the morning and your AI has been reading your sleep and your mood and it takes a little scan through your body and your electrolytes and everything. And it's like, I've written a whole playlist of music for you yeah, uh, yeah. and you're going to love it because it's like, it totally knows what you like and whatever it is, your workout, it's, and it would be like your own artist probably. I, I could wow. see this happening. And I think, you know, will that put me out of business? <laughs> yeah, right. Well, right. You know, I, I don't think we're going to get tired of seeing live performance, like a human being creating in the moment. I think yeah, that actually yeah. become more valuable. And because everything else becomes so much more digital and virtual. But we're looking for the marriage between the two and or the bridges we can create because this sort of progression is inevitable. And so it's, and you don't have to engage in it, but I think if you think about it, we do engage in it in ways that you don't have a lot of agency over, just like with maps and tracking and ads and emails and all the stuff that is actually learning so much about you, that predictive behavior that it's, it knows far more than we probably could ever imagine today. Yeah, yeah. So imagine where that is tomorrow, let alone a year from now or 10 years from now. Yeah, it's it's wild to think about where where it's all going. It's like this this idea of have you seen uh have you seen the movie Waking Life? Yeah. Yeah. You of remember, course. Yeah. I, I just I just talked I can't remember where and who I just had this this idea came to mind um recently and I think I think I was on someone else's podcast, but um anyway, it was um I don't know if you remember the part where he's talking to the guy who who talks about this sort of quickening, this exponential growth that's happening, where it take a, took us thousands and thousands of years, where we're still using the same stone tools and nothing really shifts, and then finally you make it to the, you know, recorded history after you know hundred thousand years or whatever, and then from there to the Middle Ages is only you know from ten thousand years ago to one thousand years ago, much shorter time frame and then from there to industrial revolution much shorter time frame from there to the computer age much shorter time frame how we're coming into now where full evolutions will happen 
in an afternoon, what would have been billions of years before. And it's just like, you know, 10 years from now, this could look, you know, what we're seeing can look equivalent to us comparing to the 1700s or further. Who knows? Um, it's just, it's all yeah, bets are I saw, off. I saw a statistic about, I'll bastardize it, but it's essentially like the amount of information you now see in one day was comparatively like how much there was in a whole year and yeah. X time. And before that was like in a hundred years, you know, it's yeah. like, and that's just how much is coming at us. Um, you know, on a side note, this is a slightly different subject, but um, just before I forget, you're a fan of Michael Newton and Journey of Souls. Yes, yes, absolutely. Me too. Have you ever thought or tried, is he still alive? Have you ever tried to get in touch with that guy? You know, I, I, I think... It's funny. I just asked someone this the other day. I was like, is he still, I feel like years ago I looked into it and he wasn't, but then I just brought. Wasn't alive. Brought, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> hey, but then I think back. he's come back now because I just asked my friend and they're like, no, he's alive. So it's funny because I just was thinking this, how I would love yeah, that. I Michael had the Newton. same thought years ago. I, I think I tried and I was like, I couldn't quite try. He basically, the Institute exists and he trained, they, they have a training program for other people who you could probably get pretty close to him, but I was always, yep. that book was very influential to me and it's, it still has a very close place in my heart. And I, it's, and it served like some really powerful experiences in my life with like other people where either like there's a synchronicity of suggesting that book and someone's else like, that's exactly what I was thinking. Like, or someone who's dying and it was like, we connected over that book, but they're the one transitioning and they just wanted to talk about it, the yeah. book. Because wow. it meant something to someone else and they're, you know. It's a wild thing. I mean, when you start, you know, between Journey of Souls, Destiny of Souls, there's so much information in there that, and it makes so much sense. It, it and, and it really resonates with a lot of what, you know, of course, psychedelic journeys, ayahuasca, you know, plant medicine, meditation. So many people are having similar perceptions through other means and other channels. And it's just, it's really, really, you know, it's just fascinating to consider. I had someone who came on my podcast once and he, he was, uh, you know, he claimed he could tap into people's higher selves and communicate with them. And I remember him at the beginning goes first, you know, let me do a quick, like drop in with us. And he's like, okay, so just so you know about, uh, what did he say? Um, I want to say, said like 70% or something of the people that you have on your podcast, you have some level of past life experience with <laughs> and like 30% are like, you know, a lot. And it's just like, it's just such a wild thing to think about, right? Like here we are, you know, it's how I start my book. Nice to, nice to meet you again for the first time. And it's, it's like, okay, we met like literally 45 minutes ago, aside from me listening to your music prior to now. Um, and you know, what's the real story? You know, what is there more to the story? And I, I just, I think it's the most fascinating thing to ponder. Yes. I, I think of that as the grand, as grand co-conspiracy of waking one another up and this web of connection that is like more vast and interesting, that in intricate than we could ever conceive. Like everything being in this web of beautiful connection, we're all just like this perfect brush stroke, and you go back and it's just like this incredible painting of like, wow, look at the beautiful thing we created over eons together. It's like perfect and and it's messy in the chaos. Then you see the order when you pull back and like and I that book I thought a lot about um like how in hypnosis, it, there's a translation happening through your own consciousness. Like you speak English, perhaps, you know, and your identity and, and, and the, so there's sort of a, a filter, even of metaphor and how it's coming through. And that's okay. Like, so when you recognize that it, it can even make even more sense, like the process he went through, it's like, yeah, it's always, it's, it's always, I mean, it's literally coming through the ether, through the unconscious and then through this person's funnel of their consciousness into words, into the session. And it has to go through the brain. It has to go through that process. And if you take that, you know, you don't always have to take everything super literally because you're like, well, but that's what hypnosis is about, you know, and, and that's okay. That That's how it works. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, 
<laughs> it, it, you know, what's fun about the whole journey too, is I feel like there's just more and more that it, it's, it's such a breadcrumb sort of experience that we're on where it's like, okay, here's a little more, here's a little more. And, and I always, I, I really get, I find it fun to consider like, okay, yeah, this makes sense. I know enough to know what my higher self would do. <laughs> and this makes sense. Like, you know, it's like, what would an expanded version of me do? Would they set this up in this funny sort of way? Absolutely. So it's all, it's always fun to try and to decode what, what I've done to myself. <laughs> feels, feels like there's a hand in the fog and it's like, there's just, just enough to be like, Oh, there's the hand. And then mm. you go a little more and then, and then there's another little bit of, you know, go this way a little bit, but it's never, it's never, it's always on the edge, you know, of, and I, I try to think about this idea of like, why wouldn't we design it with the lens of being a brave soul? Why wouldn't you make it so that it's the maximum you can handle mm -hmm. right up to the edge? Because then you're getting the most out of it. <laughs> so yep, you're always yep. going to be like, you're not quite over, uh, but boy, does it feel like, man, I don't know if I can take much more. And it's like, well, you, know, you can, or you're, I think you can. <laughs> like, I, I think in those terms all the time, I'm like, damn you higher self i know you wanted to do you didn't want the easy route and, and you see like people around you sometimes it's like hold on how did that unfold so easily for them and i'm like oh yeah because they <laughs> they took an easier route that's why damn it <laughs> and and you never know like the internal you, process the external can look like one thing and the internal can be a completely different process for them uh, it might the surface might be like well that's what i would want and on the inside they're like in misery it's like this is really hard, you know? Yeah. For, you know? So it's everyone's dance is unique. And uh, Ram Dass would kind of talk about this. And we do a dance together sometimes. And some dances are longer and some dances are shorter. And the person who might be twirling in schizophrenic insanity on the street, I mean, that's in essence, that moment's their dance. I mean, it doesn't mean I might not do a dance with them and try to help or not, but it's sort of blessing the dances because we, we don't know uh, on the surface to be like, well, the surface says this, so I can put it in this box and judge it and know what it is. You, we don't, we really don't. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me think of um, Michael Newton and destiny of souls. Um, was just looking, just reading a passage in that where it was talking about the birthing prog process where we're souls like the, the soul nursery on the other side and how, each soul is it like, you know, uh, breaks off, if you will, hatches off of source. You know, each one is completely unique. So there are some things that you certainly can do that are sort of standard procedure, but you got to also take into account this uniqueness of, <laughs> you know, this person, this soul's journey and what its makeup. And I find that like really interesting to consider, like what may work for you, like there's no other just even close. It's always comparing apples and oranges in a sense. Did you see the Disney movie Soul? Because when I saw that, I was like, okay, somebody's read mm -hmm. Journey of Souls. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like, totally it's like totally, they just totally. made the movie of Journey of Souls. I yeah, was like, yeah, oh my yeah, God, yeah. this is amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's so good. I was so glad to see that movie was made. And just to think of all those, the children who are going to now, you know, have that as their baseline idea. Yeah. Of, you know, reality. God, and then, uh, man, speaking praise to that movie. And then the, because I love that it was about like music. Because then mm -hmm. I'm like, yes. Yeah. And then <laughs> on top of that, the music that John Baptiste wrote and Trent Reznor wrote music for that with Atticus Ross as well. Mm -hmm. the, some of those riffs they got into, that one where he's playing the piano and he actually gets into that ecstasy, like the music yeah, itself yeah. was incredible incredible yeah, yeah it's yeah. like oh my god and it's like they're just taking it to the next level with that yeah yeah and yeah, the cartoon yeah, yeah. was like actually playing perfectly you know they mapped uh the actual players and it was like new levels of technology of animation of like i was looking at it, like that guy is that cartoon is playing this what you're hearing properly exactly, right, exactly right. with the muscles and everything in the hands and what a trip it's a, it's what a trip indeed. Yeah. Uh, wow. Wow. Well, this has been quite a trip indeed. Uh, as we sort of wind down here, what 
question that I have for you. Uh, what is, what's most exciting for you right now? What, well, really two questions. What's most exciting for you when, it, when I ask that question, what comes up? And then if you could leave any, you know, East Forest mic drop sort of message for the audience, um, <laughs> what would it be? Well, what I'm excited for, I mean, it, it feels like uh, I've been saying the same message to myself and others for the past 12 years since I got that message myself. Just And it just feels like the world is catching up a bit with it. And there's this intersection happening that feels really good. Like, like, like we're, oh, we just got into harmony, you know, and we hitting this beautiful chord. And it's sort of like learning how to sing after all these years and now your partner is singing with you and you're like wow this feels really good this wave we're in feels really good and it is a, a song of co-creation it's a song of of uh, reminding one another and forgetting together but in that inspiration it's just something that when i say it as i said at the beginning i want to be a cheerleader for other people and souls to say we can do this and I'm saying that to myself as well, because I have doubt too, of course. I have personal doubt and I have doubt in the world and in the injustices that we see, but we need to sing that song to ourselves to say that we can do this. Because if we lose that, if we lose that harmony and we don't even try to get back on the next wave, then we're really lost. But I believe in the soul to say like, to, to help us have the inspiration, whether it's like the sunset that takes us back out in the ocean to surf again, or this that candle flicker within us that doesn't go out that says, you know, it's always there. And so it's just about uh, do, doing that work to, to, to believe. And I think the role we can play for one another is just to encourage each other to say like, try again. Um, or like, I, I see you too. I witness this process and you're not alone and I'm going through it my own way. And that witnessing is a lot more powerful than you think. So yeah, I, it's, it's sort of cultivating my own optimism for the six-year-old who was in first grade, who is pessimistic in what I saw in front of me that I still see in front of me. And that pessimism is pretty baked in, but I, I work on cultivating that optimism uh, that comes from the heart. Beautiful. Well said, man. So <laughs> what else we got here? I do have one last question, actually. Sure. That, uh, it's all in, good. Unless you, okay. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Felt amazing. This has been a very, very cool conversation. Super appreciated it. And, and before I ask the last question, I just want to make sure people know where to find you. Um, you know, you'd mentioned you have some new music coming out. Maybe you can just, you know, name all the things. Um, yeah, I mean, East Forest is easy to find wherever you listen to music, but eastforest.org will definitely take you to everywhere you want to go, whether it's the music platforms or my my Patreon, which is sort of like a way to engage in monthly all sorts of things like actual engagement together. Mm -hmm. um, that's patreon.com slash eastforest, but it's also just at eastforest.org. The podcast, retreats, um, there's lots of ways to engage. So, um, and I, I have started releasing a new album called Possible. And what that means is it just comes out, you know, track at a time. So it's more of a conversation and that's already underway. But the Ram Dass album, definitely check it out if you haven't. And I have an album called Music for Mushrooms, a soundtrack for the psychedelic hmm. practitioner. So if you're looking for a guide for your journeying, uh, check that out. Or if you're just looking for music to put on to relax to, that one's very deep and peaceful. It's five hours. So that's also on 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 the music platforms as well um but i cool. before you ask me whatever the last question is I, I did want to ask you a question yeah i'm just sort of curious after how many you've done like 1500 episodes or something Four, I mean, 14 i think it's somewhere around 14 been a lot <laughs> how a many lot. years is that it'll be six years next month and I was just curious from you, not like what your favorite guest is, but if you could try to find an aggregate of like a kernel mm. that you can pull out of all of that for yourself that you're kind of carrying with you, yeah, is there yeah. something? Because that's a lot of like synthesized experience. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, hmm, great question. And I actually, 
I just released, so, so the podcast being, you know, 1400 episodes, lots of, um, lots of talking, considering, as you can imagine, many, many hours there. Um, but I just released a book called the golden key, modern alchemy to unlock infinite abundance. And that is, you can listen to it in three hours or a hundred pages, you know, read. And that really is my distilling down even beyond the podcast, 25 years of deep exploration of this topic. You know, I got really excited about the ultimate nature of reality in the late nineties and have just been like, you know, talking to anyone who would listen. And it's one thing to kind of understand the stuff theoretically. And then it's another to apply it to your life in a way that's meaningful. And, and it's like, yeah. you know, it's like Mike Tyson says, you know, everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's the, you know, we can all relate to that with our spiritual development is like, yes, this is how it is. This is how we do. And then all of a sudden something happens and you're just like, you know, right it's, back in your old house. It's the phrase Ram Dass said, uh, you think you're spiritual, spend a weekend with your parents. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, another great one. Same exact thing. So I think that the, the end, you know, if, if I had to sum it up, it really as the, I have eight keys in the book and the eighth key is. Uh, that kind of ties them all together is master the universe, the Y-O-U, universe. And um, when you start to play with this idea that, you know, you're the only one in the room, it's all a reflection of you. You're a node, a focal point that source is experiencing through. And for all practical purposes, there are no others. It's all, it's all, everywhere you go, you're there waiting for yourself. And it's, it's a, um, you know, everything and everyone that you bump up against is a prop in your movie, you know? And, and so you're a, a prop in, that I created in this image with this personality and, and vice versa, right? So you're a, you're a node, a focal point that source is also looking through. And so for me, this idea of mastering the universe, it's really empowering because it's like, of course I make it. I'm the only one here. You know, um, of course I didn't make it easy. That would be boring. Like, well, you know, imagine playing a video game where it's like you go straight to the end and it's like, well, that was, there's no sense of accomplishment, you know, as we talked about a little bit earlier. So I think that's the thing that I've really come away with, um, more than ever is this knowing that, um, you know, there's going to be ups and downs, you know, my, my show being positive head, sometimes we're like, oh, just being positive all the time you know, that kind of got positivity, got a negative rap in recent years, you know, which I think is funny. And it's like, no, being positive about the negative, about the shadow. You've never seen a great work of art without shadow in it. Right. And so it's, it's, it's all, you know, learning to be at peace with the journey, with what is not needing to, to all be just this all flowers and rainbows and, and unicorns and knowing that, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, so important that I'm the only one here. And therefore, you know, it, it, it's always, it, it's, if I haven't won, it isn't over, you know? And so just applying that, that idea just really, really empowers me. You know, I like to say our, our lives play out at the corner of free will and destiny. It's all destined because, um, you know, well, or we can see Einstein, you know, prove that if you shoot me in outer space, you bring me back a day later, I'm a day older and you've been dead for 50 years or whatever it is. You know, it's, it's, it's like that movie interstellar when they're on that planet for like a couple minutes and like 30 years plant passes on earth. That's based off real science. So we know that time is this illusory construct. And so your fifth birthday party is happening on another channel. You're just not tuned into it in this moment, just like future potentials. And, you know, so, so that's how we can sort of come to terms with the idea that it's all destined. It's all happening in the eternal now. But where free will comes in and is the, the option of which version you're going to step into. What, you know, what version of the movie are you going to pop in the player? And um, kind of like Neo at the end of one of the Matrix movies where he comes in, all of them are on this, the versions of him, they're on the screen. Okay, which one are you going to choose this time? And I believe that's, that's in effect what, what's going on. It's like first time I ever had a psychic intuitive reading years and years ago, she's like, oh, I see you in a cold place like Chicago working in business. I was planning to move to Chicago and work in business at that time. And we were in Atlanta when I was getting this reading, so very far away from Chicago. And she goes, oh, but there's this whole other path in California and music. And years later, I formed a band and moved to California and how I initially got here. And um, so, um, you know, what was she seeing in that moment? The potential Brandon's based off where I was vibrationally. So 
you know, from this now moment forward, there's infinite versions of us, I believe. And which one do we want to experience? The greatest and grandest version, the one that's the most rewarding. Uh, regardless of the statistical probabilities or odds or any of those things, I believe Source has been there, gotten, been there, done that, and gotten the T-shirt, right? So it plays out every potential. It's infinitely abundant. It plays out all the potentials. So, you know, learning to get into vibrational alignment with it, being it to see it, you know, and and learning how to navigate and 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 all the challenges are really just blessings to make it more rewarding when that ultimate, you know, I made it to the top of the mountain moment only to then find there's more mountains and more vistas to, to scale. But um, I would say that's the thing that is really, um, you know, as, as my golden key is the master of the universe, I'm, that's what I'm here to do, to, to tap into the nature of the situation in which I find myself and um, use it to the, you know, the, the fullest of my ability in a way that benefits everything and everyone because it's all an extension of self. Well, that's quite a distillation of uh, 1,400 some odd episodes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I just saved you how many hours? Like, <laughs> boom, cliff notes. <laughs> cool, man. Thanks, yeah, man. I appreciate yeah, that's, that's fun. Um, well, I, I, I look forward to being more introduced into, into the world. And this has been fun, man. Fun chatting. Yeah. You know, I was thinking um, one of the plans here that I have a, communal space here, uh, Mystic Manor in Venice Beach, where um, pre-COVID we were doing retreats and listeners would come and spend time. And of course, we halted that one uh, out of necessity for COVID. But uh, one of the things that we're hoping uh, we can get to um, perhaps this summer is doing like events, transformational community, like, you know, live musical performance. Uh, we have a really nice, you know, kind of... Um, compound if you will uh for venice beach it's very private um and so wow. um so having like dj live musical performance we have a pool party pool club kind of thing so it'd be cool if you ever make it out this way maybe you can uh bless us up with some uh, east forest jams one saturday take it man well let's keep that prayer that these things will come back for us i think that kind of community gathering is really nourishing so absolutely Absolutely. I do have one final question I'd like to ask you. Yeah. My, my, my closing cliche question. Closing is, cliche. That's not a stunning endorsement. Okay. <laughs> the closing cliche. Uh, the closing cliche question is, in 60 seconds or less, what is the meaning of life according to East Forest? Oh, my God. Um, let me say this. Uh, Anyone who says they have an answer for life in 60 seconds or less that is anything other than perfect silence is uh, <laughs> just snake oil. <laughs> As Lao Tzu said, the truth cannot be spoken. So any man who's speaking the truth is not speaking the truth. <laughs> the meaning of life I saw the other day on a, on a billboard on the side of, a, side of the road. The meaning of life is to, is to make your own meaning for life. So I like that. <laughs> I, I did see I, or I heard about a YouTube video where the title of it was like, what is the meaning of life? And it was the Dalai Lama and it was 60 seconds. So someone's like, well, shit, um, I'll click on that. And essentially he was saying you know, the purpose of life is experience. And uh, that's, that's certainly one way of looking at it. I mean, it, you know, I'm not trying to do, um, judge that. It's like, well, we're here to have experiences. There's an argument to be made. <laughs> I mean, it's happening yeah <laughs> oh man well this has been awesome man i i so appreciate you and all the work that you do in the world and there's very few it's not very often i come across music that resonates as you know like yours does so thank you for tuning into what you're tuning into and and bringing that through into the world it's super epic i look forward to hearing all the new new stuff as well and yeah all of you out there listening thank you for tuning in and thank you for uh, your bravery and, and tenacity and, and doing what you're doing and just keep doing it. So thank you. All right, everyone. Till next time. Journey well. Love you so, so much. Also, before we sign off, I wanted to remind you to download the Golden Key audio or ebook as my free gift to you at goldenkey.gift using the Golden Key code POSITIVEHEAD. And please, if you enjoy my gift, 
leave a positive review on Amazon so others can find the book and unlock their lives with the help of the golden key as well.